Welcome to another episode of Search News You Can Use with me, Alec Brownscombe. And me, Dr. Marie Haynes. Well, thanks for joining me today, Alec. Well, thanks a lot for having me on. I think it's long overdue. Yeah, really, right. I'm going to introduce you to all of our listeners here. If you're new to listening to podcasts, um, uh, well, even if you're not new, you may, you've may you probably heard me speak about Alec because Alec has done so much for MHC. Uh, but Alec is our technical director of uh, SEO at MHC. And uh, he's been with me for, is it five years now, Alec? Yeah, five years next month. Next month, right. Um, and when we first started, we were, uh, well, I mean, initially I was a solo consultant. And then I hired Alec along with Dylan and Cassie uh, to uh, to just do some work with me. To I had way too much audit work and uh, I wanted a few people to uh, to gather some data for me. And it's grown into so much more than that. We've, we've developed so many programs, so many uh, uh, ways of assessing websites. And Alec is a huge, huge part of, uh, of this development. So Today, we're going to talk about traffic drop assessments. Um, Alec, do you remember when we first started, uh, what kind of things were we doing to assess traffic drops? Because they've changed a lot, haven't they? They certainly have, yeah. Um, it would largely start, I guess, with just sort of digging into Google Analytics traffic history and Google Organic and trying to pinpoint and focus on particular dates of concern, uh, compare sort of traffic patterns across search engines uh, and year over year, um, and do some digging into the page level of traffic data to get a better handle on the situation. I think we were mostly just trying to determine whether we could conclusively say it was a Google update or a Google change yes. that affected the site and, mm -hmm. and not a technical or seasonal factor. And then we could start to dig into you know, our site quality assessment from there to try to find where the site may be lacking or falling behind based on our understanding of what Google views as high quality in a website, which, you know, can was effective and I still think can be effective. Mm -hmm. But there, there, I think we learned over time that there is more we can do to really understand what is driving the drop in Google organic um, traffic, which can then kind of inform the strategy for traffic loss recovery going forward. Exactly. Yeah. I remember, do you remember the interview question that I, I give to everybody when they uh, join us is um, we show analytics that show a drop in Google organic traffic and also a drop in Bing and Yahoo Google organic traffic. Yeah. And then we ask uh, the, uh, the person who's interviewing, is this likely to be due to a Google update? And it's amazing how many people got it wrong, <laughs> you know, because obviously if traffic drops um, in all three, uh, a drop in Bing traffic is probably not because Google has updated their algorithms. Uh, and, and so that was kind of the, the beginning of when I was looking at traffic drops was basically uh, my very, very first reports were, yes, you've been hit by Penguin or yes, you've been hit by Panda uh, and no recovery advice whatsoever was just uh, diagnosing that there was a hit. Um, and I think uh, over the years, our recovery advice has really, really changed because um, for a while, uh, our advice was improved site quality, which, I mean, is always a good thing to do. And, and we're going to talk a bit about that today. Uh, but sometimes a drop in traffic, um, we've seen sites with, you know, decent quality that have had significant drops. And so today we're going to talk about um, uh, trying to determine whether drops are due to other reasons uh, than just quality uh, changes on a website. Um, and we, you know, when we really uh, started, I think EAT was the the big thing that uh, we were training you guys on, right? Um, uh, EAT, that that probably was the the bulk of your a, a huge chunk of your training when we first started, wasn't it? Yeah, that'd be fair to describe. I mean, I think I sort of naturally gravitated into some of the technical aspects of SEO as well, but that was certainly sort of the uh, bulk of what we were working on when we first started. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when we were assessing, so sites would come to us uh, with a big drop and often we would say, well, look, you don't have as much EAT as compared to your competitors. And we'd uh, help them improve their EAT by, you know, getting more links and mentions, maybe improving schema, improving uh, the trustworthiness of the website in, in different ways. Uh, and then bit by bit, we had sites uh, that had technical issues um, that often were out of my realm of expertise. And this is where Alec, uh, you really 
really shone with uh, with figuring out, um, you know, the technical aspects that can cause a site to drop. Uh, and and so I, I just appreciate you so much for the knowledge that you've got there. Uh, for those listening, Alec has trained uh, all of the MHC staff on uh, technical things that can affect a website. And and I've seen your knowledge grow as well. I We, we didn't talk about this before, but where do you get your, where do you learn your technical SEO skills? Um, well, I kind of, it's kind of rooted in the fact that um, what I was doing before I came on board with you um, in 2017 uh, was sort of working on my own website for a good amount of the time. Mm. Um, and that was sort of, I guess my background is kind of interesting in that uh, education wise, I didn't study any form of business discipline, let alone marketing. It was really history and journalism, which not thriving industries as we all know. <laughs> and then um, sort of iterating and playing around when growing my own website, which is dedicated to the Toronto Maple Leafs, unfortunately. unfortunately. Um, so, <laughs> so like it's sort of an unorthodox path, but I think um, when I think about SEO as sort of like a holistic discipline, it kind of requires constant tweaking and tinkering and iterating and improving on like a wide variety of both editorial aspects and then technical aspects. So having that background with, you know, journalism and writing and history, and then also um, building my own online community and my own successful publishing website, I think dovetailed kind of nicely. And I think that's kind of, mm -hmm. it's an unorthodox path but, path, but in a lot of ways, I feel like I am sort of where I'm supposed to be. Well, that's great. And I'm so glad that you are here. <laughs> I'll tell the story of when, <laughs> Thank uh, <you>. yeah, <laughs> I think it was a couple of weeks after uh, I hired you, Alec, you came to me saying you had multiple job offers uh, from people, you know, closely connected to the Toronto Maple Leafs and, and sports in industry. And I thought for sure that we'd lose you because you're so talented and, uh, and Alec stuck with us Thank and, you. and, uh, and has built out uh, some incredible stuff. Um, I was reading through, so we have a new uh, traffic drop assessment, and we've been talking about this a little bit. Uh, last week's episode, or two weeks ago, uh, for those who are listening, um, I talked about multiple things that could cause a site's traffic to drop. And so if you missed that, that's really a, a good idea to listen to that if you're trying to assess a drop in your website's traffic. Um, and one of the things that this is one of the things that we do very often is is assess website traffic drops and Alec uh, and the team put together a traffic drop assessment which looks at multiple things and I found this quote so this might be a little bit long uh, to read out sorry Alec you're gonna have to sit here while I read this <laughs> uh, but this is a, a no quote worries. from <laughs> from John Mueller in uh, a Google Help Hangout recently. Um, and somebody was asking a question. I, I've said this quote before in podcasts, but I think it's worth repeating. Somebody was asking a question about a website that had seen a decline with a core update. And they had been doing things like fixing their ad experience, which is a, a good thing to do. Um, and uh, and a few other things uh, all around the content. So, you know, improving their technical SEO and improving site quality in this way. And uh, I really, John's response response really, really struck me. He said, with core updates, we don't focus so much on just individual issues, but rather the relevance of the website overall. And that can include things like the usability, the ads on a page, but essentially it's the website overall. And usually that also means kind of the focus of the content, the way you're presenting things, the way you're making it clear to users what's behind the content. So to me, that's kind of EAT. Uh, like what the sources are and all of these things. So John said, just going in and changing everything around the content, I think you can probably get some improvements there. But essentially, if you really want Google to see your website as something significantly better, you probably also need to work on the content side. And at least from the focus point of view and think, where might there be low quality content? Where might users be confused when they go to my website? And is that confusion something we can address with technical issues, with UX changes, or do we actually have to change some of the content that we present? So uh, do you have thoughts on that, Alec? Because that, to me, that's just a very incredible quote. Yeah, I think that really does sum it up quite well. Um, I think we've sort of seen with recent core updates that um, sort of the way it's gone is that you know, we had Medic in the 2018 and the 2019 updates that seemed to be these really gigantic 
sort of paradigm shifting, ground shaking updates. Um, as we've moved forward, I think we see a little bit less of that um, than we used to with some of these recent core updates. And I think a lot of it is more focused around the fact that uh, it really is a lot about intent shifting and relevancy yes. uh, refinements and stuff within Google systems and uh, really about how you approach content and your semantic SEO, I think is a, a huge determining factor in your success. And certainly how you approach your content strategy is obviously right at the heart of that. Yeah. And so some of what we're trying to do now is to determine uh, why a core update um, had issues with the site because I think in the past, you know, we've always focused on site quality. That's something that we do really well is understand, uh, you know, Google appreciates this uh, technical aspect or um, appreciates EAT uh, in certain ways. Uh, and lately, uh, what we're, we've been digging into is relevancy and intent shifts. Uh, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, do you, when we find that uh, Google's understanding of relevancy or the intent of a query has changed, are these things that can be remedied, do you find, for most sites? I think it's to borrow, you were quoting John Mueller, so let's use a John Muellerism. Uh, it, it sort of depends. <laughs> it um, depends. <laughs> some, yeah, totally to depends. Uh, sometimes it may be that Google is like simply preferring a different type of page matching a different intent. So or you produce maybe reviews of products and now they're showing more category pages or product pages from actual retailers, that can be a pretty tough problem to overcome in such a case where you're not really selling the product yourself. Um, but maybe you do actually offer both types of content as well, right? And maybe you can make a strategic decision on maybe how you're internally linking them within your site, or maybe the informational page appears to have really lost relevancy for that intent over time. Um, and it may never return. So you think about something more drastic, like simply rerouting things with a 301 to the other page. It's really sort of hard to say without knowing the specifics of any given situation. Obviously it's kind of like a no one size fits all that would flatly apply across the board. But on the, the relevancy front, like maybe your article from 2014 was a great solution to a problem that has significantly changed since then. And your content isn't really targeted properly anymore, but it could be made to be with a revamp and an update to that content. And then sometimes with relevancy shifts as well, it's a case where you're receiving traffic that really, really wasn't intended for the query. Um, an extreme example might be like you sell a product that had a couple of X's in the name and you grabbed uh, a bunch of adult traffic that really wasn't intended for your page. Mm -hmm. It's now maybe finding its proper destination. Uh, so hopefully your conversions aren't down in those cases. Um, so it's kind of whatever, but if you're partially or fully relying on ad impressions, uh, that traffic is probably one that needs to be written off at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel like we've seen that a few times where, um, a site has come to us with a big traffic drop and, but really no drop in, in sales or conversions. Uh, and that would be that Google has uh, determined that they're not, the pages that they were ranking were not actually relevant. So those pages probably weren't converting anyways. Uh, so you might be getting less traffic, uh, but you're still getting traffic to the pages that are important. Um, and that, that can be helpful. Uh, I think one of the things that we found is um, sometimes uh determining that there's been a shift in relevancy or Google's understanding of intent um, is important because it means that maybe you don't need to make any changes. You know, maybe you don't need to be, uh, we, we have people who come to us who have had audits from like five or six different SEOs sometimes uh, and trying to fix, you know, everything technical possible and still haven't seen improvements. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe that's not the route to go. Um, yeah, I think that's such yeah. a good point because, um, we can get into a little bit of what we're doing now with the traffic drop assessment, which I think addresses some of that confusion. But I think determining what is driving the drop, whether it's likely to be a site quality issue, whether it's a SERP feature change, whether it's a change in Google's understanding of intent or relevancy for particular pages and queries, or some combination of all of that, I think um, can be a real source of confusion for a lot of site owners and business owners now. Um, I think the honest truth is that even on our side, we traffic in a fair amount of like educated guesswork when your day-to-day -day mm -hmm. job is analyzing what the black box Google algorithms might be doing and how to refine or adjust your SEO strategy around that. Um, it's even more confusing for site owners whose primary concern is basically their product or their service or their content output every day. 
they're not following the minutia of what Google says they're doing and what SEOs think they're doing or how best practices might be evolving. So I think a lot of what we've been trying to do with our new traffic drop product is just add significantly more clarity and certainty to yes. what could be happening at the time of Google organic traffic loss, which is obviously always a really scary time for anyone who's invested in the success of the affected website. But like, mm -hmm. like you're kind of saying, um, I see that a lot, what you're describing in terms of a lot of site owners see it, uh, Google traffic loss, and they want to start changing things. Um, it's understandable that they want to take action as soon as possible um, as the SEO is responsible for their client's traffic performance or as the business owners who are seeing sort of the, the bottom line impact of those shifts. Oftentimes, I'll find that they're, there's something they didn't like about their site before the traffic dropped. They'll say like, oh, I hate the links that we built recently, or I hate that our page experience metrics are so poor. Oh, mm -hmm. or I always knew we shouldn't have moved to that WordPress theme or my SEO no indexed all those pages and that must have backfired. Whatever it is, they tend to gravitate towards it as the first explanation and they tend to want to address it right away. Sometimes in a bit of a panicked, not fully thought through manner, maybe depending on sort of the stakes and the personalities involved or the individual dynamics of the situation. So the concerning part about that is that you, you might be channeling your efforts in not just a totally wrong direction, but you could actually be actively making things worse if you're not careful and calculated yes. in your approach to those problems. Um, and I think we, we can get more into it, but I think some of it is also rooted into a bit of a misunderstanding of how a lot of these modern algorithm updates work. Yeah. Yeah. Which Keep is to say, yeah. I, yeah, which is to say, like, I think I see it a lot with clients where there's sort of that old, I don't know if it's a penguin or a panda mindset in terms of if my site dropped, I assume Google must be punishing my site in some way for mm -hmm. something I specifically did, which could be true in certain circumstances. Like say you made some suspect decisions and tanked the quality of your site in the intervening period between two core updates or whatever, or you built so many unnatural links, you finally got smacked by the manual action team. Uh, but the truth is often much more murky and nuanced than that yes. now with these updates. And I think that's where we can enter, right? Which is Mm -hmm. using uh, a much more data-driven approach. We try to separate sort of the wheat from the shaft and, and give site owners a way better understanding of not only uh, where the traffic loss occurred, but whether it's likely to do with a change on Google's side that you can't do much about, whether it's a clear indication of a site quality issue, whether it's a simple technical oversight that you didn't realize was maybe there and affecting your performance. But knowing, coming to the right conclusions there and putting in that work up front then informs the strategy of what you do. Because sometimes the unfortunate reality, like you just said, Marie, is that you should not do much of anything specific to this drop. I mean, keep improving all the things that you know you need to improve, but specific to this drop, maybe there's no real action to take, which mm -hmm. I, I think in my experience so far with businesses that are approaching this the right way, they appreciate that answer as value yeah. in and of itself, because they might've spent tons of resources pursuing something that was not likely to give them the recovery they were envisioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think people are always looking for the easy, quick fix. And, and, you know, some of that, you're right. When you mentioned Panda and Penguin, uh, you know, those were things where we could say, oh, you were hit by Penguin and we have a remedy for that, you know, for a lot of sites, not, not all sites, yeah. but, uh, you know, we, we could disavow or you were hit by Panda. Google had given very specific, well, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to hesitate on that. We as an SEO community had very specific remedies for Panda. I I'm revisiting those now. I actually feel like Panda um, was the basis of what now is core updates. Uh, and I think a lot of the things that, you know, we simplified it as, oh, you have too much thin content, or maybe you have content that's yeah. uh, copied from other places. Uh, I, I think that was a vast oversimplification, but at the time it gave SEOs something to do. You know, it, it we, we always, Whenever you do an audit, I'm sure, uh, you know, we always get to that point where you get to the end of the audit and you're like, oh, no, I don't have a smoking gun. Uh, I didn't find anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that happens more and more often now that, uh, you know, we can say, well, yeah, you could improve this, you can improve this. Uh, but really, like those don't attribute, you can't attribute a massive drop to those little things. Uh, and that's very challenging as uh, SEOs, because we want to find yeah. fixes, don't we? <laughs> um 
Marty Orberstein wrote a uh, a really great article uh, on the Wix website uh, this week or recently, uh, talk, looking at sites that had seen declines with the and improvements with the May core update. And something struck me uh, as really really interesting. I'll link to this article in the um, in the description of the uh, the episode here, uh, where the things that he was pointing out as reasons why a site did well or why a page did well were things that SEOs would not recognize as ranking factors. You know they were things like, um, uh, you know, does uh, it, this actually answer the user's question better? Or it was easier for the user to find the information because it was it was displayed in an easier way. Um, and as an SEO who might be knowing traditional ranking factors and understanding how PageRank works, that's really hard to, to grasp that uh, little minute details like that could be uh, determined by Google's algorithms. Um, and the reason why I'm saying this is that I really think that um, if John Mueller says that, you know, the most important thing is content and Google's uh, core update questions, which I talk about all the time, I always have the page open on my website, are all asking things like, uh, does your content provide substantial value? Uh, uh, you know, things that you couldn't make like a yes or no checklist. It's it's very subjective. Uh, and so we've been talking a lot about uh, potentially Google using machine learning. Uh, to determine just uh, un, I don't want to say unmezurable, but factors uh, and, and how to weight them for ranking. What, what do you feel about, do you think Google's using machine learning for uh, determining ranking weights and factors? Uh, almost certainly. Um, and I think in a, a number of different ways. Uh, I think it's, I don't want to get on a tangent. I don't want to open a can of worms, which in this industry, I think, uh, this would this kind of statement would be prone to do, but I think that there's definitely an element of click signals that Google has to be using uh, okay. to help them with that. Uh, if you have mountains and mountains of click data available and the advanced ways machine learning could be used to leverage those signals to determine what the best, most relevant results are for the query, it makes me think that they really have to be a part of it. I know that's not always agreed upon in SEO circles to say the least, uh, I think it was Cyrus Shepard who said something I really agreed with in an article in Moz, uh, I think it was last year or six months ago or something. He said that whatever way SEOs think Google might use that data, how Google actually uses it is going to be far more advanced than anything we can conceive. And I think mm -hmm. that ambiguity or that complexity gives them a certain level of, I don't want to say it in a cynical way, because I don't really mean it that way, but it gives it a certain plausible deniability in terms of whenever they're asked about click signals specifically or any of the individual metrics that, that people ask them about, you know, dwell time or bounce rate or whatever the individual metric is, it's certainly true those particular metrics are not used in the ranking of websites within search results. But mm -hmm. there are patents out there that do, there's patents out there that do describe how click signals could be used in a way that would cut through the noise and the spam and the manipulation and the variability between queries. I think the question that I always come back to is, what if Google could adjust the weighting of things on a per query basis? Would that not create a really reliable and scalable solution and explain a lot of what we see in the search results? And the patent that I know Cyrus cited and that I've read now um, that the late and great Bill Slosky used to write about was about uh, Google categorizing queries as you know, informational slow and informational quick. We were talking about intent earlier and there's kind of a tie in there where um, I think they are able to, and I'm not a computer scientist, I'm only a meathead marketer, <laughs> but <laughs> this is something where I think machine learning could solve for it, I would think, that relative to the query, which say Google determines that if the query is informational quick or informational slow, um, as in it's an answer that can be provided very quickly or an answer that yes. searchers tend to spend longer trying to satisfy. Um, they could determine the correct denominator as far as what constitutes a long click, a short click uh, relative to the query. Um, so if you had the ability to know how long it takes for users on average to be satisfied for the query, and then you had a set of results where you can measure long and short clicks relative to that in order to determine the truly high quality, relevant winning pages, mm -hmm. you could probably come to a reliable way to measure which document from a set of documents, set of relevant documents, is, perform, is performing the best, delivering the best experience, satisfying the searcher's needs. I think you would also be able to then 
perhaps know which types of results. So the pages that have yes. a transactional bent or an informational bent are satisfying searchers of that query the most. And you would perhaps show more of those types of results for that query, which could drive the intent shifts that we see in addition to, obviously they have a generally improved understanding of complex language within queries as well with models like BERT and so on. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, you reminded me of uh, years ago when I was at MozCon and uh, Rand Fishkin did a little experiment where yeah. he uh, he had us all search for a, a particular type of steak restaurant or something like that in Seattle. And, uh, and then he had um, everybody click on the number one result and immediately click back uh, and then click on his friend's result, his friend who owns a, a steak restaurant uh, and linger around the site and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and active or kind of react to the site a little bit. Um, and within, you know, a very short time period, uh, his friend's site was, was ranking well. And a lot of people uh, took that information and started businesses, uh, you know, doing click farms, uh, basically saying like, oh, well, now click through rate is a ranking factor. And I don't think it's as simple as that. You know, I what exactly, you were describing. Yeah. yeah. What you were describing there about um, uh, I, I think Google can learn, you know, so if people um, uh for this type of query tend to spend time on this particular type of site. Well, they can learn what is it about that site? You know, what is it the way that content is displayed? Is it uh, the type of content they have? Uh, the types of intent that we we kind of talk about as SEOs are very, very broad. Like, uh, is it an informational page? Is it a, a, a navigational page um, trying to direct people to a store? Or is it a transactional page? And we've certainly seen those types of shifts where, uh, you know, Know, maybe you were ranking for transactional pages uh, trying to sell your product and um, and now Google's determined that well you know most people actually just want information on this uh, we've seen that but I actually think that um, there are uh, smaller intents that Google can determine uh, you know that that we wouldn't be able to ever make a list of ranking factors uh, I think there's probably millions of them um, would you like would you agree with that Definitely, which I think when you're from a client's perspective or business perspective and you're thinking about, you know, determining how do I go about improving my content um, in a way that's going to be productive, I think you do have to cry, try to create a set of metrics for it that can make sense and can help you action ways to improve the content based on those key performance metrics. So I think you should try to under, make an understanding of like, let's take into account things like not just traffic and maybe the initial click through, but let's think about things like session duration and bounce rate, yeah. conversion rate. Let's decide on what are the most important indicators of user satisfaction on our website. Let's yes. determine like what are the underperformers and what are the high performers within our site. And let's truly understand what's driving those outcomes as best as we can and understand it honestly and relative to your competition in the SERPs. Now that's easier said than done. But I think mm -hmm. if you're taking that sort of holistic view on it, it's going to lead to success in all sorts of ways that Google is going to pick up on that. Um, it's, a, it's important to take a big picture, look at it as well. Like John was saying, uh, say like if you're producing hundred blogs a year, because that's just your policy and that's what you're paying for. And you're only getting traction on a few of them. Very few of them are converting or performing like, like you thought you need to have real honest conversations with yourself about the types of things that you're lacking and where you really need to go to improve, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember, I mean, there was a day where as SEOs, that would be our advice is to publish something every single day. Um, I think before, uh, assuming that Google does use machine learning to to weight ranking factors, uh, before that happened, and we were focusing on traditionally just the page rank driven algorithm, which page rank is still important. Uh, I'm not saying that course, it's completely yeah. gone away. Um, but when it was the most important thing, uh, then um, having multiple pieces of content just for the internal links was was very, very important, you know. Um, and so I think there's still a lot of people out there that are producing content on a, a massive scale uh, where the vast majority of that content is really not valuable to anybody. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, that's you're exactly right there, figuring out what parts of your content are valuable to people and what it is that people are engaging with uh, is, is really the key here uh, to, uh, to creating better content. Um, I, and and yeah. just really nailing intent, I think has also been a big yes. focus of ours with client um, with clients. 
I was reading, I, I, I always go back to it. I was reading a great article on this a while back. His name is Tyler Hermanson. He wrote it in Search Engine Journal where he basically pointed out a that like a good keyword analysis these days is like creating a persona for the keyword. So he would take mm. a keyword and he would map out not just uh, the obvious information about it. He would break it into implicit and explicit information that was attached to the query. So the example that I sometimes go back and look at how he broke it down was he used safest baby cribs of 2022. And he had two columns. One was explicit information. One was Im implicit information. Um, the obvious information about that query is that uh, the searcher is concerned about the safety of their baby. Um, they want multiple cribs to search for, um, and they're looking for something that's recently been published uh, mm -hmm. with most up-to-date information. But then you dig into it and you think about the more implicit information that's implied there. They're likely first-time parents. Uh, they want to know the individual aspects of what will make the crib safe. They under, they're understanding the fact that the standards for safety have changed over time and they're looking for something very recent and fresh and up to date. Um, they're sort of in the research phase at this point, they're not yet ready to buy. Um, they might be interested in other items given they're probably first time parents and buying other items for their, their baby's room. Um, and it may be true that safety is their number one concern versus all the other different considerations that could come into buying a crib. Um, and when you think about all of that, you're digging a lot deeper than just the surface level meaning of the query to sort of really understand what a searcher is looking for. And then you're structuring your content around that. And yes. I think that's a brilliant way to approach a content strategy. That's really good. I really like that. I haven't read that article, so I'll find it now. And uh, you know, maybe you can I'll share it with it me. You, yeah. I'll, yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll make sure that that's in the notes as well. So other, uh, other people can read it as well. Um, I was going to go somewhere with that. Oh, yeah, I wanted to mention uh, this article that I read recently from Neva, uh, which is a competing search engine to Google. And they talk about using quality raters uh, and using machine learning with quality raters, which has been a, a, a debatable thing for Google. I think in 2018, Danny Sullivan said that uh, Google was not using the quality raters uh, to determine yep. machine learning. Um, but that was some time ago. And, you know, I think I think things have changed. So I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about that because I think that's a, a rabbit trail that uh, could derail us for a bit here. But I think in a future episode <laughs> or maybe yeah. In, <laughs> yeah, in an article, I'm, I'm going to talk about that because they were talking about very specific queries uh, and they actually had instead of just random here I go talking about it even though I said I wasn't going to uh, <laughs> um, they instead of just having random quality raters who you know maybe don't have expertise on a subject uh, they had for this situation it was programmers um, who had like a you know years of programming experience and they had them do uh, query searches for different programming queries and they said what was your intent when you did this query and it wasn't like as as you know tiny as, uh, oh, I had an informational intent. It was like very specifically, I was looking to find content that gave me this and this page had it right in the table of contents or, you know, like it was, it was really, really down to the query level, um, uh, how they tried to uh, make things more relevant, the results more relevant. So that was fascinating to me. And, and we don't know to what extent Google is, is doing that or if they are. Uh, Bing has been very open about uh, using machine learning uh, I believe at one point they said, you know, Bing, no engineer at Bing knows what the ranking factors are uh, because it's all determined by machines. So yep. my point in saying all this is that, uh, oh, go ahead, Alec. Yeah, yeah, you had a. No, I, yeah, I read that Neva article as well. I think it was, it was really interesting. It makes me, like you were saying, it does make me wonder if it's a kind of like a feedback loop situation where the quality raters don't just evaluate the outcomes of changes, but they could perhaps provide the high quality uh, data sets that can actually train the machine learning algorithms more effectively. So in that way, it's not, it's true that the quality raters are not directly influencing the ranking of websites, but they're perhaps providing the training set yes. that improves the overall human rated quality of the results. Exactly. So yes. it affects ranking in that way, if that makes sense. That's kind of what, what I was thinking when I read the article. 
Yeah, yeah. Which means, so as an SEO, that makes things difficult because, you know, we can't, uh, I saw there was some debate uh, on Twitter this week about whether checklists are good. Checklists are good for for a number of things. Sure. Uh, but I think it's very difficult to make a checklist uh, when you're assessing content. Um, so one of the things that we do really well at MHC is uh, we call them page comparisons where, uh, you know, after a big drop in traffic for an individual keyword, what we'll do is we'll look at, well, who actually won with, uh, if it, assuming it was a Google update, what pages did well. And then we compare that to the client that we're reviewing at the time um, and just think like a human being. Now, it's difficult because we might not have subject area expertise, uh, but I think that really this is one of the keys is to, um, is, is to look at the page like a user would. And I've had a number of people reach out to me since the uh, the Maycore update and uh, say, well, you know, this spammy looking page started to outrank me. And when I look at the quote unquote spammy page, yeah, it might not look pretty, but the user's answer was really easy to find, you know, and as a searcher, I, I would uh, I, I would prefer that. So I think a lot of the keys to recovery are in looking at uh, who's outranking you. Um, now, did you have anything to add about our, our uh, page comparisons? Because, uh, you know, I, I think they're fantastic. I'm a bit biased. <laughs> I, I'm also biased, but I agree. <laughs> um, I think it's um, I think we also have really been helped by having access to some cutting edge tools that provide us with the granularity to the data and the powerful multi-layered filtering to find the optimization opportunities and really sort of while, while we're working on the bigger picture items with site quality, uh, we're able to sort of provide the, the traffic op growth opportunities in the month to month. So with just having that real focus powered by, you know, data, a real focus on improving content quality for semantic search and really nailing intent like we've been talking about. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk a bit about the, the tools that we're using? Yeah, so... Um, people should be familiar with it if they aren't, but um, one of them is, uh, of course, Analytics Edge powers our uh, traffic drop assessments. So we're, we're sort of pulling from the GSC API um, and we're doing a lot of filtering, uh, sorting by page query, specific date ranges, uh, isolating the queries, driving the traffic loss as best we can. Mm -hmm. And then we're starting to, using sort of that data-driven approach, we're starting to piece together a picture of what might actually be happening with a site's organic traffic performance over time and at a particular Google change or Google update, um, which, like I said, is really helping us determine what is driving the drop um, and what the yes. cause of that drop is. So uh, Analytics Edge has been hugely helpful for us in that regard. Uh, we're also using Two Octobers, um, yes. which is a tool uh, built out by a brilliant guy named Noah uh, Lerner, who I really recommend SEOs follow and big shout yes. out to him. Um, a really powerful Google Data Studio dashboard built out around GSC data uh, with really powerful multi-layered multi filtering options so that you can really dive into a series of reports that can be super helpful for optimizing around, you know, identifying where you're losing ground in rankings, identifying where the opportunities lie. Um, it's there's so much that goes into the tool that's kind of hard to describe in a one in a single answer, yeah. but uh, it's been really game changing for us in terms of how we approach those page level optimizations that we were talking about. Yeah, and I, I'm so excited uh, by this. I, I think you know we've got a number of clients now that we've got set up on this system, and uh, and and now we can do ongoing uh, recommendations for you know not just technical aspects to improve, not just here's how we can improve EAT, which again are, are very important things, but um, you know every every month or on a regular basis look at uh, where the changes have happened in a website um, and what consistencies we can find, and then how can we remedy those? How can we improve Improve our content to uh, uh, to do better. It's it's very very exciting. Um, do you want to uh, maybe share uh, some of the examples of the um, traffic drop assessments that we've done? Now, clearly, we can't mention our clients themselves, so we're going to have to dance around a little bit uh, with uh, you know what these sites are. But I, I'd love for you to share uh, some of the insights that we've learned from doing these reports so far. Sure. Uh, I guess the first case that comes to mind is. 
there was a case where Google organic traffic was a down around, I'm going to say 20, 25%. Uh, the client was stuck on a few possibilities uh, without going into too much detail. It was some technical SEO fixes that had not been brought to fruition. Uh, There's some sources of what they thought to be, you know, thin content or duplicate content among other concerns that they had. Um, and we dug into the data um, and after our analysis, we found that more than 95% of the traffic loss at the time of the Google update was driven by a reduction of traffic through specifically branded queries, uh, mm -hmm. despite, and this was really interesting, despite no recorded position loss or ranking loss for those queries, uh, according to GSC. So there's a corresponding impression and click drop for branded queries, but no position loss, which to us tends to indicate, you know, a seasonal change, less brand interest whatever the reason, but there were no real explanations there either, despite exhaustively working through those possibilities. So they have a brand name that is a generic word and they get a ton of branded traffic. That's a large percentage of the traffic profile. We were able to isolate the traffic loss more or less belonging to a percentage of those branded traffic queries, largely taking place in certain regional language markets. So it was really much more likely to be an intent thing, not a site quality thing. So we arrived by the end of it at a majorly different perspective on the whole thing once the data was uh, properly, you know, pulled and analyzed. Um, and we did come to some good conclusions about the SEO issues they were concerned about and they're working on those, but that was not what drove the drop at that time period, which was a, a pretty big revelation for them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Trying to think of some other interesting cases that, that we've worked on. Um, we've certainly had cases where traffic was notably down and drastic actions being considered in all sorts of areas of the website. But once we dug into the data, we could, we could clearly see it was actually a particular section or type of content that drove a fair amount yeah. of traffic, but hadn't been optimized properly. It kind of been neglected over time. So we really dialed into optimization strategies uh, for that particular type of content um, with a good uh, recovery outcome in that case. Yeah, um, yeah. All of which was made possible by just really taking the time and care to understand what drove the traffic loss in the first place, as opposed to jumping to conclusions that are usually rooted in uh, quite a bit of confirmation bias. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially regarding links. I, I think we get a lot of um, a lot of people come to us for uh, thinking that unnatural links have pulled their site down because that was my history. You know, I started uh, in SEO in, in helping sites with unnatural link penalties. Um, and so a lot of the time when a site owner sees, oh, my traffic's dropped, they'll uh, start doing some reading online and people will say, yeah, it's because, you know, you have all these bad links, um, which might have been good advice uh, years ago, but, it, you know, it's rarely the case now. Um, and so we see people who are spending all sorts of time and money, maybe filing a disavow, um, you know, and then you've got to wait to see, is that going to work? Uh, and when it doesn't work, they're sort of stuck with, you know, what do we do now? So I think a lot of one of the really big benefits of these reports is uh, is saying, well, yeah, it's always great to improve site quality, but uh, here's where you need to focus um, as opposed to, uh, you know, just exactly following following your instinct of what you think it could be initially. Um any other uh, cases you want to share or what do you think? Uh, there was one, you said links. There was a case where uh, the drops were clearly to do with Google changes based on the sweeping site re wide ranking drops. And when we categorize things as site quality issues, usually we're looking at, you know, 80, 90 or more percent of queries are seeing drops on. Um, and usually it spans a lot of different types of queries, a lot of different types of content, depending on the complexity of the site. Uh, but in this case, there, there was that pattern, but it wasn't really happening at the time of known or suspected Google updates, which was really mm -hmm. interesting. Sometimes that points to a technical thing. Sometimes it's a seasonal thing. But no, again, nothing was surfacing that provided an explanation there when we talked to the client and when we did the digging ourselves. So we could see in the data, um, as it turned out, and based on a timeline of the links that were built to the site, there have been really, really aggressive unnatural link building happening. Um, and when new link campaigns would launch, they would help for some time, we would see it, um, but there was usually a return to earth eventually. And yeah. Marie, obviously you're far more credible on this than I am, but I think this can happen probably because we it know Penguin still. runs in real time now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it runs in real time now, right? When it runs, so it's not yeah, like yeah. there would be an announced refresh or anything. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily be paired with a major Google update. Um, but in that case, the link profile was predominantly unnatural links. It was leading to a bit of a roller coaster ride for them. Thankfully, not a manual action as of yet. 
Um, but they're sort of, with that in mind, they're now addressing sort of how to take a more sustainable link building approach going forward. Yeah, yeah, which is which is tricky, you know, because a lot of sites, uh, if you've had success with building unnatural links or buying links or, uh, you know, uh, building a PBN, uh, things like that, uh, it's almost like an addictive thing. Uh, it's kind of like having a gambling problem, you know, that uh, you, had success yeah. at, you had success at one point uh, and then uh, you just keep thinking you're going to have success. And we have people come to us saying, you know, well, I just need to get better links, which is not necessarily wrong, um, but getting good links. Uh, it is not uh, something that you can do easily. Um, and that's something where uh, we don't at MHC, we don't do link building, but we have some really good partners that uh, we do refer people to, um, to try to get the type of link that um, would matter even if they were no followed, you know, the type of link uh, that um, improves the authority of your business, not just tricks Google's algorithms into thinking you have better page rank. Uh, and so um, things have changed a lot over the years uh, in, in how Google uh, rewards good sites uh, these days. Um, what else should we talk about here? Do, I, do you want to maybe finish with uh, uh, talking about what we can offer? You know, when I first started, um, offering site reviews, we really didn't do a lot of um, advertising our technical expertise because like I said, you know, mine was, I had a little bit of know-how, but uh, you've really elevated that. Um, you want to talk a little bit about what we could, uh, what we can offer to, uh, to people who want technical SEO help? I think you're exactly right. Like our team has grown, not just in, in number, but we've become more and more adept and attuned to how to bring value to clients in a, what's a really highly dynamic modern Google search landscape, right? And uh, I think we obviously still have the capacity to do the site reviews and we have, I know, sites interested that are interested in a sort of a comprehensive audit of their site from top to bottom. And we analyze your traffic history and uh, dive deep on your content quality and your EAT and your technical and your competitor analysis. It kind of, while we, we kind of keep you on top of all the latest advice and best practices in all those areas, but we've also got the capacity now to take on more ongoing engagements as well with clients where we're creating sort yes. of those action plans specifically tailored to your site and improving your SEO performance where we are calling on some of those cutting edge tools. We have a much more technical knowledge and um, amongst our team to, to not only provide everything that I just described in the site audit, which is a, a thorough technical audit of things that could be affecting quality and a thorough EAT analysis and content analysis but we're able to sort of get into what we are talking about with the page level optimization. So we're working on sort of those big picture items, but we're also providing you with all those traffic drop opportunities that are there uh, month to month um, with a real sort of focus on improving content quality, um, semantic search and nailing intent. So I think it's, yeah. it's an overused buzzword in search, but we definitely have a very holistic approach to it now, which includes, you know, making sure that your technical house is completely in order as well. Um, certainly there can be technical issues that uh, create quality issues. Uh, they're not, they're, they can be, one can lead to the other. If you have obviously a scores and scores of thin content or duplicate content that's creating massive crawl budget concerns and stuff that can certainly have a technical component to it or technical root to the problem. So we're able to sort of diagnose those issues while also looking at the bigger picture and knowing sort of where to steer the ship in terms of what's really going to move the needle for the client. Great. Yeah. I'm, I'm so thrilled with what we've, uh, what we've uh, built over the years uh, and we've helped a lot of websites. So uh, again, thank you, Alec. And, and thank you for doing this talk. I, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. It's Alec's birthday today as we're recording this. So what a great thing to do on your birthday, right? Do, <laughs> do Absolutely. Well, I mean, uh, what better way to distract myself from the, from the specter of my uh, terrifying rapid aging, <laughs> and chatting about uh, traffic drops in Google search with you, Marie. Oh, well, uh, yeah. Thank you. That's great. Not to depress well, everyone, but. Yeah, really. <laughs> Last question. Are the Leafs ever going to win the cup in our lifetime? <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. Oh, man. Um, here's my thing with it. It's like, I could be honest and I, the cynical side of me wants to say, obviously not. And the curse is real. Um, <laughs> but I am a Leafs fan, which means that there's always a small part of me that that still believes, right? Um, I don't know why hope, we do that. Hope springs, I don't know either. I think it's something that probably requires therapy to work through. I think but, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, hope springs eternal every fall. And I think 
there's always Austin Matthews and then there's always hope as long as Austin Matthews is a Maple Leaf. Well, there you go. You heard it from Alec. He knows the Leafs well. So and we've been hurt so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alec. I'm ready and, to be uh, heard again. I'm ready to be heard again. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Um, for everybody who's listening, if you do want to reach out to us, you can find us at help at mariehaines.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter all the time, Marie underscore Haynes. You can reach Alec on Twitter as well. What's your uh, Twitter handle there, Alec? It's, of course, Maple Leafs themed at uh, Maple Leafs HS. Um, not an overly active Twitter user anymore, as much as I was in the 2000, early sort of 2013, 14 era when I really got into it. But I still mm-hmm. really love it for keeping up on all the greatest, latest uh, content yeah. out there in SEO and hockey and everything else. So, yeah, yeah. I, feel free I to reach Twitter, out. Yeah. Um, feel free to reach out for sure. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for listening. And I wish you the best of luck with your rankings. <laughs>